Good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you're joining us from, and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Kyle from Business Review, and I'll be your host today. It's our pleasure to have ILC Dover with us, who's presenting this webinar entitled High Containment for Lyophilization Processes. Today's guest speaker is Scott Patterson, Vice President, Pharma Bio Technical Support. I'd like to welcome you all to our webinar platform on 24. You'll notice that this webinar is browser based. So if you disconnect for any reason, please just click on the link you received by email to rejoin the session. If you want to ask any questions, you can send those in via the questions widget. Just type them into the box at the top left hand corner of your screen, click submit, and we'll have some time at the very end to address any questions or thoughts that you may have. Please use the yellow help widget if you require any assistance and you can move, resize, and maximize any of the windows in front of you to get a better view of the slides. But for now, please allow me to welcome Scott Patterson. Over to you, Scott. Thank you, Kyle. Uh, again, welcome everyone today to our uh, webinar. Um, our webinar today is High Containment for Lyophilization Processes. Uh, we're going to focus on the use of single-use isolation technology for the high containment purpose. Uh, today in our program, we'll cover a, a range of uh, topics related to high containment, uh, starting with the containment challenge when trying to work with a lyophilizer. We'll take a quick look at a single-use example so that we can clearly show what the technology looks like. Um, the purpose of uh, using isolation technology is to protect the product, the operators, and the environment or the processing area, so we'll review that. Uh, we'll give a few examples of actual solutions applied to lyophilizers and uh, the specific containment designs. As always, in using high containment, uh, transfer technology of moving materials in and out is a critical part of it, and so we'll take a look at options for transfer technology. And then the real value of using the single-use technology for high containment and having reduced cleaning, reduced validation, and, and cost savings. As Kyle had mentioned, we'll leave time at the end for your thoughts and questions. So please, again, send those in um, uh, using the box to type in your questions, and, and we'll review those at the end of the webinar. So here is the uh, typical lyophilizer uh, system, and, and the challenge being uh, how do we contain this, particularly uh, in this typical design with uh, the door that needs to open and close. Uh, again, for the most part, the containment system has to be retrofitted to the lyophilizer. Um, so a lot of this is done in the field. Uh, but new systems are often uh, subject of containment, and the approach is about the same for how the high containment system can be adapted to the lyophilizer. Uh, the key point, again, is the door and keeping uh, the door contained and while it's uh, opened and closed, uh, but really then we're looking at the ergonomics and, and a serious issue uh, when trying to contain a lyophilizer is to maintain good ergonomics for the operators to do the handling of trays and product and so forth. The transfer points, which we'll, uh, we'll study that for, for a bit later in the webinar, but the transfer points uh, of how do we get materials in and out is, is always critical in the typical design. Not all lyophilizers are the same. Um, so this one, a little bit easier than a multi-tray type of lyophilizer in the last slide. The pizza door, as often referred to, um, is somewhat easier to manage since uh, the trays are handled in one location, if you will, at one height. Um, so not all lyophilizers are the same, and we'll see a couple of different examples, including a very, very difficult a uh, lyophilizer system to contain, and then some of the easier, smaller ones uh, in different approaches for the containment of these different systems. So here's the basic concept uh, of using single-use isolator for uh, containment in a lyophilizer. Uh, this actual photo that we're seeing to the right is, uh, is of the uh, sister of the lyophilizer, if you will, a tray dryer used in pharmaceutical API manufacturing. but. The challenge is exactly the same. Uh, we have uh, multiple trays. We have a door that has to open and close. Um, and so you see uh, how the operators are working inside the isolator through the gloves. And, and, and the key to the picture that we're showing here 
is where the operator is positioned and the operator is standing uh, at 90 degrees to the actual uh, single-use isolator. And, and this is to promote the idea of ergonomics and how easy it is for an operator to move uh, using this type of technology. This is one of the absolute keys when considering containment in a lyophilizer is the ability for the operator to move about and handle the trays. Uh, and, and in a lot of occasions, as we'll see, having to pass a tray uh, after taking it from the lyophilizer to a table uh, someplace where further work can be done. So a brief history on the flexible containment and single use. So this is not a new technology. Uh, single use technology really came to fruition in 1997 and it was the, uh, the thought of uh, Eli Lilly uh, who recognized in their pharmaceutical manufacturing that the compounds they were developing were becoming more and more potent and they had to apply more containment uh, to protect the operators and to protect the environment. Uh, in, in the early days, the, the whole concept was really uh, how do we protect operators from exposure to highly potent compounds? And also then Eli Lilly took a look at the high costs of uh, things like uh, hard wall isolators, laminar flow, booth, laminar flow booths, uh, split butterfly valves, and this type of technology. So they also had a goal, you know, the primary goal was to uh, assure operator safety and the secondary goal was a cost control. And so through their processes, both the chemical synthesis process and then on to oral solid dosage processing, uh, this flexible containment technology, the single use technology uh, came, came into the process for, for high containment. So it's not a new technology and has been proven now for uh, well over 20 years. But a lot has changed since 1997 when the thought was to apply single-use technology for high containment processes. Uh, certainly from the definition of high containment uh, in 1997, uh, the, the gold standard was containment to less than one microgram per cubic meter. And today the typical process uh, is well under 0.1 microgram or 100 nanograms per cubic meter. And we're starting to see com companies talk about projects to contain within the picogram uh, limit. Also, it's, it's, uh, it's extended in terms of uh, applying containment and the purpose that it, 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 it's applied. So we no longer just start looking at operator safety and maybe some cost impact but now it's been extended to some quality issues with respect to cross-contamination of the product, which then extends to the health-based exposure limits that are now uh, part of the regulatory world, and this is focused on patient safety. So uh, the use of containment has, is perpetually changing, and, and the key here is uh, controlling cross-contamination while providing better and better containment levels for the high-potent products that are being developed. So one thing we know is in any containment project um, in, in any process that the containment uh, will be needed in a perfect process like lyophilization and the freeze drying, uh, if it's a perfect process, uh, we really don't need uh, any containment. Uh, the product coming into a lyophilizer is uh, in liquid form, so the risk of handling a liquid is, is very, very low. Um, the product is in a container, let's say a vial, and it has a stopper that is placed on top. And so we have a product in a closed container and a liquid, so we have extremely low risk. Uh, even after the freeze drying process, the product comes from the lyophilizer. It should begin be in the closed container, the vial, and with a stopper on top closed. But that's really not the reality, and, and nothing goes as planned in, in, in typically in processes, and so things can happen that will cause an upset condition uh, things like the vials breaking inside the lyophilizer, uh, vials uh, that, that fall over inside the lyophilizer. And so now through the freeze drying process, we now have solid particulates that get airborne and now they cause a risk to operator exposure and the, and the ergonomics of, uh, I'm sorry, the operator exposure uh, and also exposure into the environment. So uh, the containment system 
is in place to allow for controls during these upset conditions um, that we can see through using the ICHQ9 uh, risk management system and doing a risk assessment. And, and so as we look at a risk assessment in handling product in the lyophilizer, it's clear that the process will fail. Um, it's typical to have an upset condition. And so then the containment system is then designed for those particular risks that, uh, that are seen during this risk assessment. So single use uh, isolator technology, uh, what, what is it really doing? So it, it's multi-purpose. Uh, you know, initially as product is going into a lyophilizer, it can be used to protect the product. Again, the product should be in a closed container but we want to protect the product from contamination, from the room, from operators, and, and so forth. So our first goal in the process is to protect the operators, uh, I'm sorry, protect the product. And then through the lyophilization process, now we have a potent compound and a, uh, a solid. So we no longer in liquid form, we have a solid. So now we're looking at operator protection uh, to uh, to protect them against the, that potent compound, we do that through the environmental control of the uh, of the isolator. And in a lot of cases, we use pressure control in the isolator, uh, potentially both a positive pressure during uh, the loading stage and a negative pressure in the uh, unloading stage. But the key here is really looking at the ergonomics and making sure that we've uh, designed a containment system that allows the operator to do that work uh, very ergonomically. Uh, the alternative technology of using a, a restricted area barrier system or a just using the clean room um, are often much easier in terms of ergonomics than an isolator. But in both of these cases, they fall short of providing the total benefit that isolation technology really provides. Um, and certainly a clean room uh, it really goes against the modern thinking of containment. Uh, in a, in, and when containment is needed, uh, the, the concept is contain as close to the source as possible and not to use the room as the containment device. So, so certainly a clean room without any uh, containment technology, any engineering solutions, and just using PPE becomes the easiest thing for an operator to use but also creates a lot of risk uh, when, when using that type of uh, uh, thought. So we've all seen in isolation technology the challenges that we get into with uh, hard wall isolators. Again, if you recall the first picture we looked at with the single use isolator, the operator was easily able to work at 90 degrees to, to the isolator here. Uh, very typical, even through uh, best practices of designing the isolator using mock-ups and, and, and trials to uh, mimic what the operations are going to be. Things that can't be controlled are the, uh, the, the, the operators, the, the height of the operators, the size of their hands, uh, different uh, attributes from different operators. And so oftentimes we do end up with very poor ergonomic systems. And then the other part of it is that we often uh, see that a process will change. Uh, either a part of the process will change or the entire uh, requirement in the isolator could change. And so when using single-use systems, we deal with both of those. First, from the ergonomic standpoint, that we create a flexible wall uh, with glove interfaces, interfaces to allow ease of motion for the operators. Um, again, we use a uh, bungee cord system with this flexible isolator to allow that operator to have a full range of motion and so forth. So really, the ergonomic issues that are seen in isolation um, are minimized when using a single-use flexible wall technology. But really then, <clears throat> it, it gets to the second part that uh, the process can change or uh, e even the overall product and what is done in the isolator may be different, and, and that can go for the lyophilizer as well. And so in a single-use technology, uh, that can be adapted easily. Uh, the, by definition, single-use, the isolator is used and then disposed of. The next version of the isolator could be modified for any changes that are needed, and that's done extremely easily. Uh, when using a hard wall isolator and trying to change a glove port, move gloves positions and so forth, extremely expensive, 
uh, revalidation and, and and a high cost to uh, to do that. So the ergonomics and the ability to adapt and change in a single use system is uh, is at a premium. So here we're going to uh, play a video um, just to show the ergonomics of a single use system. Um, in this video, you'll see um, the operator is uh, essentially loading the powder into a, a milling system. Um, we're, we're viewing it through uh, the isolator wall. So also with single use isolators, again, the ability, the, the vision to work through the wall and to, uh, to see what's going on inside is, is at a premium. Um, but as you see, the operator is able to scoop material from uh, a, a bag and, and easily load it into the isolator. And you can see he's not restricted at all as he moves uh, around inside this isolator. And, and this is really what we, we promote as a premium is, is ergonomics can be um, the same almost as working without isolation technology. So this is, uh, this is a very good example of uh, of how the operator can move around, easily manipulate products and so forth. And also you can see here uh, in this video that uh, you physically can see the dust coming from the powder transfer and so forth. So when we start talking about high containment using a, uh, a single use isolator, we, we really have the ability to have that containment into the nanogram level. And in this case, uh, uh, even when there's a lot of visible powder that's airborne, uh, this, can, this can be maintained. So we're going to pop to another video and back, getting back more directly to the lyophilizer. So again, this is one of the challenges that, that we get to, and we would uh, sort of label this as uh, don't try this one at home because this one is uh, uh, one of the more complicated lyophilizers in terms of the size and the door to be able to have containment. So we have a very large door. We have trays that... Uh, are, are at an elevation that makes it difficult for the operator to work. So we see in, in this operation, the operator has to take the tray from the lyophilizer after the freeze drying process, and he's going to move that to a laminar flow hood for further work. Um, so again, in this strategy, uh, they're really using PPE as the primary mechanism for operator safety. Um, and then they're really using the room primarily as the containment device, uh, followed by putting the trays into the uh, the laminar flow hood. So in, in this case, a very difficult application. Uh, we did come up with a unique solution that, that's shown graphically here with this drawing. And in this solution, and this gives you an idea of how single-use technology can be adapted very easily, although this is a, a complicated system, you see the operator is, is actually standing in, um, if you will, a, a box uh, that uh, completely separates him from the process. And through in that box, he reaches through the gloves to pull the trays out of the lyophilizer. And you see the series of gloves on both sides, particularly uh, to the operator's right-hand side, that he can then turn and hand the tray to another operator that operator will then place it on the table behind uh, the, the first operator. So we're mimicking exactly what we saw in the video, trays being taken out of the lyophilizer and then placed in an area to do further work, unload the trays and so forth. But it's all being done in an isolator and not relying on the PPE and not relying on the room as the primary method of, of containment. So more examples, so there's there's all kinds of different lyophilizers. So the last one we saw was a very difficult one with uh, with a very large door and, and uh, multiple trays at, at an ergonomic challenging position. So here's the, the easy side of it, a, a small lab and formulation uh, lyophilizer uh, that we see in the picture on the left. Um, in this case, uh, this is probably not even a CGMP operation. We see it uh, sitting in a lab environment uh, but in this case, again, the customer was interested in having some containment for an upset condition. And so on the right, you can see a very simplistic static pressure isolator. So there's, there's no positive or negative pressure being uh, circulated inside the isolator. But the static pressure isolator is in place to allow for an upset condition 
Uh, some materials that might get into the environment are, are uh, contained within the isolator. So, so very simplistic, very simple design uh, to meet that requirement. Um, again, going maybe to a little bit of a larger scale, but, but, but possibly in the same realm in terms of pilot plant size, uh, something to make clinical supplies. But here we have a lyophilizer that does have the door and multiple trays. But we set up the same kind of single-use isolator system here. Uh, again, it's simplistic as it's, it's a static pressure. Uh, again, this may not be a CGMP environment, but, but again, we're trying to assure containment uh, within the isolator uh, in an upset condition. You'll see here at the bottom right of the drawing of the containment system is the bag-in, bag-out system, and that's one of the transfer technologies that we'll, uh, we'll look at uh, briefly here. Um, move, uh, so here, uh, we've got a polling question, so I'll hand it back to our host for the polling question. Thank you, Scott. It is now time for our first poll, so I'll quickly read this out. So to take part, please click one option, click Submit, and then wait for the next slide to view the live results. Our question is, would you consider using a single-use isolator in an aseptic process to reduce the risk of any carryover particulates or bio burden? And the options are, we already use single-use isolators in these processes. If using single-use isolators, do you mean reuse and sterilize the isolator? We do not use single-use isolators. We do not use single-use products, but we'll consider it. Okay, so we're going to have just a moment to think about that. Um, in the meantime, Scott, do you want to elaborate on this question just while people vote? Yes, we, um, we, we see uh, certainly one of the growth areas in, in the industry is uh, septic processing. Um, and, and the lyophilization process is often required to be done in an aseptic condition. And so this is a, um, a, an interesting area because there needs to be containment, there needs to be the aseptic condition, and, and there's a further view on uh, contamination and particulate and so forth. So uh, in, interesting how different companies are viewing uh, engineering controls for these type of processes. Okay, very good. Hope that's enough time for everyone to think about it. Let's have a look how that turned out. Hang on. It's on slide 19. There you go. Looks like we have a bit of a spread there. Is that what you expected to see? Yes, I, I think with um, both the idea of aseptic processing and also, um, you know, which technology is used, it's, it's clear that traditionally hardwall technology, uh, hardwall isolators have been used, but, uh, you know, there is uh, a growing requirement uh, for these single-use isolators. Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll keep going through the uh, containment solutions uh, that have been applied to lyophilizers. So here, uh, again, now we're stepping up from the sort of non-CGMP type of process to an isolator that has a controlled environment inside. And so this would be, uh, let's say, a grade A or grade B environment inside. So it's not considered a septic, but it is a, a controlled environment uh, to create that clean space. And this is done through uh, either a negative pressure or positive pressure system. So typically um, with uh, the lyophilization lyoph process, we, we, we would be looking at a positive pressure. And we're going through a HEPA filtered system to exchange air inside and then create this low particular level of as low as grade A. Um, again, there's a small differential pr pressure from the inside of the isolator to the outside but this is common technology to be able to control the environment inside to create that clean space. So this is a step up from those static pressure examples that we gave that, that may or may not be really providing product in a GMP environment. Here is certainly something uh, for the production mode. And then the step up from that is, uh, is creating a septic condition inside the uh, single use isolator. Um, so this is becoming more and more uh, common to have an aseptic requirement inside the isolator for the lyophilization process. In the single-use systems, the most common 
uh, process for creating the aseptic condition is including the uh, vapor hydrogen peroxide, the VHP process, to do the sterilization. And so, the uh, again, the same system that does the pressure control, a, a positive pressure inside, also is assisting in going through the cycles of the VHP process um, to go through and dehumidify and all of the cycles for uh, creating that aseptic condition. So here, the uh, single-use isolator can have the benefit where it could be reused, uh, it can go through multiple cycles, or uh, potentially to reduce the risk of cross-contamination, it can truly be a single-use isolator and, um, and, and be disposed of after the use uh, so that the risk of any cross-contamination is, is mitigated. So uh, going on to the transfer technology is a key role in the containment. So it's uh, somewhat easy to put a, uh, an isolator around the process and, and have high containment, but uh, we, we do need to get the product in and out, obviously, so it's a process. So we, we have to rely on different technologies to get those transfers in and out. And, and, and the different technologies could be used for different reasons. Uh, again, looking at, well, what is the next process for the materials in the transfer? When we bring the materials out of the lyophilizer, where does it go to next? What, what is the process? Uh, will the transfer require containment? Again, in transferring product in, we've seen uh, applications where because it's in liquid form, there hasn't been a lot of emphasis on the containment. So, you know, is the transfer going to require containment? How large are the materials in the transfer? And that can be a key in what technology is used and how the transfer is done. And, and will the transfers require, you know, a septic control? Do we have to hold a sterile condition as we're doing a transfer in and out of the, uh, the engineered uh, isolator? So looking at that, there's different technologies. And one of the most common is the rapid transfer port. Um, and here on the left, we're showing a, a simple flexible isolator, single-use isolator that has the uh, RTP, if you will. And so in, in this case, just like on a hard wall system, the alpha flange is designed to be mounted, uh, permanently mounted to the isolator. And then as you see on the right, um, the um, containers that move product in and out uh, have the beta flange to connect to that alpha flange. And so it's multi-use. Uh, we can do multiple transfers in and out of the isolator. Uh, also then there is the, um, the beta bag, which is shown on the lower right picture. In the beta bag, we're able to combine sort of that technology of the rapid transfer port and the benefits of that, including being able to do aseptic transfers um, and getting the single use or flexible uh, technology of the beta bag. And the, and the beta bag has some, some good value in terms of sizes and, and uh, a little bit less, uh, less weight to transfer and so forth. So uh, the beta bag is, is also a good technology to use for the transfers. And then we have pass box technology, which is uh, extremely common on hardwall isolators as shown on the right. So you see this, this isolator shown on the right. We have a small uh, box where uh, materials are passed into in a, in a contained way, and then the door opens to move the product out. Uh, the same technology is shown on the left, but in the flexible single-use technology and a uh, pass box that uses zippers to pass the material in and out. So this is good technology. A lot can be done with it. Um, challenges include uh, the fact of, well, how big of a transfer can be done, not only dimensionally, but uh, the weight, as you can see, um, on the, the right-hand side, particularly, the transfer box on the isolator is is uh, is relatively small and, and and may be difficult to uh, move larger items that uh, that that have uh, you know weight to it, where we we might only be able to handle it with one glove while it's inside the isolator. And also, uh, pass box systems, we have to be careful in multiple use of pass box systems that each time. Uh, we open those two atmosphere, we do have a risk, so we, we do have to go through a risk analysis to see what is that risk of uh, potentially having the uh, exposure uh, occur, uh, moving product in or out. Uh, the next technology is the bag-in, bag-out technology, which is really the single-use technology. Um, this is an extremely good technology for large sizes. Um, and it doesn't take up much space uh, with uh, the isolator system. So on the left, you can see that it really is 
uh, an extension of the single-use isolator. It is a flexible sleeve that's connected to the isolator system. And, and then the picture in the, in the center is really showing that there's been a transfer, in this case, of powder into that sleeve. And then there's a, uh, a secure seal and separate uh, crimping process, if you will, to separate the sleeve then from the containment system. And now this, uh, this material can go uh, into the next operation, whatever it needs to be done. Uh, the beauty of this uh, system versus the Passbox system is that sleeve, as we see it on the left-hand side, has never been inside the containment area. So the sleeve is completely clean and can be handled by operators on the outside and then taken and transferred anywhere that it needs to go. And using a secure uh, seal and separate like the crimping system, uh, this can be done without risk of exposure or even uh, um, uh, the, well, having the product uh, open to the environment at all. And then lastly, we look at the split butterfly valve technology. And, and this is an interesting technology because it does combine the idea of high containment with transfer. Uh, and, and some of the systems that are available now also can be done using an aseptic condition. So we can have an aseptic transfer through these. So very interesting technology. In this case, we're showing uh, the split butterfly valve connected to a plastic bottle. Um, Again, one of the challenges, though, that we, we have with split butterfly valves is the size of the transfer. Um, by nature, they are butterfly valves. And so as they open, the, the wafer, um, and in this case, a, a, a two wafer system, uh, are, are sitting right in the middle of the transfer. So instead of having, let's say, on a six inch diameter split butterfly, you don't have a true six inch opening to pass things through you have basically two half moons that are split by the, the valve wafer sitting in the middle. So it's good technology and it lends itself to some types of transfers, but because of the limitations of the size and the wafer in the middle, it can be a little bit restricting. So here we'll, we're going to take a look at cleaning validation when it comes to the lyophilization process and, and, and some of the cost savings associated with that. So here the comparison that we're going to make in the next couple of slides is about the single-use isolator versus a hardwall isolator. But we could do similar analysis when we look at the other technology that's commonly used in lyophilization, including the RABs and, and, or just using the clean room. And, and there we would look at things like energy cost and, and certainly the maintenance of, uh, of HEPA filter systems in rooms and so forth, how to monitor and clean, uh, clean the clean room, uh, cleaning of RABs and maintenance of RABs. We, we would take a look at how much PPE is used, and in, in, in particularly when the clean room is used as the main containment uh, mechanism, you know, how much PPE and, and gowning is needed, not only the cost of the PPE, but the time for gowning and, and what have you. So these are the type of things that, that we would look at in those comparisons. But, but here we're going to look at, you know, a quick comparison of single-use isolators versus the hardwall isolator. Uh, but before we do that, we have our, our second polling question, so I'll hand it back to our host to address this polling question. Okay, thank you again. It is now time for another poll. So for anyone who missed the first one, just click one option, click submit, and wait for the next slide to view the live results. But the question is, do you currently use single-use products to reduce cleaning validation SOPs in your processes? Uh, we do not use single-use products in our processes. Yes, we have found that single-use products are effective, or no, we are still required to do cleaning on a single-use product. Okay, so once again, everyone's going to have a moment to think about that. Uh, Scott, is there anything you want to talk about, elaborate a bit on this question? Um, yeah, so it's, uh, again, uh, uh, an interesting um, uh, and, and somewhat always decided company by company in the, in the quality department of, you know, how to do uh, or when to apply single-use products and then how to look at cleaning. Um, is that decontamination for removal? Is it complete cleaning and so forth? So uh, we do see a range of strategies that are implemented by the quality departments of different companies. And so it, it really gets to be an education on how each process and, and really how each company looks at uh, uh, the implementation of single-use products and, and with respect to cleaning. 
Okay, very good. And I think that's enough time again for everyone to vote. So let's see how it turned out. Okay, there we go. Once again, there's the results. Anything you notice about that? Yeah, it's um, uh, again uh, clear. You know, we have uh, the we have found that single-use products are effective, and and so we have a, a big chunk of our our attendees uh, uh, selecting that. So, so again, I I think if this goes to the idea that single-use technology is is not really that new, but and again, the processes that it's being applied against is is really expanding quite a bit, and this uh, tends to tell us that. Yep, uh, single-use technology is being applied in a, a range of processes. So we'll move on uh, to the the final part of the uh, the webinar, and and so here we're back to uh, the discussion about cleaning. And so um, uh, in a uh, recent uh, publication of the Parental Drug Association, we see uh, something that's really debated within uh, the experts in the industry in talking about. Uh, non-product contact surfaces. So usually it is a product contact surface or a non-product contact surface. And, and generally it's, it, it's black and white in that way. In, in this uh, uh, publication by the Parental Drug Association, uh, we're, we're talking about indirect product contact. So this gets to be interesting because the, the definition of indirect product contact versus the black and white product contact or non-product contact is that uh, surfaces with proximity to open products. And so that's a perfect definition. And as, as seen in, in, this, uh, in this guidance, this is uh, uh, directly uh, a situation with lyophilizers where, um, again, in the lyophil lyophilizer, uh, the the trays in, in the, the area in the lyophilizer is not a product contact surface, but it's in direct proximity. And if the product is open, if a stopper comes out, uh, anything like that, then then the potential of having airborne particulate get into the product is is very real real. And so with that, looking at a lyophilizer, and also then the isolation technology that comes with that. Uh, all of these surfaces are considered to be uh, something that needs to be cleaned uh, so that we don't have the risk of cross-contamination, and, and, and that's the whole purpose here. So, so even though, by definition, we could go as far to say that the surfaces of the isolator are non-product contact, uh, they are within uh, close proximity to potentially open products, and so then we have to treat them, uh, as this guidance says, as product contact surfaces with validated cleaning methods. So here we uh, we take a look at then what does that mean? So you know with the lyophilizer, it it will be what it, what it is that those surfaces will have to be cleaned. Those are you know stainless steel surfaces, reusable surfaces. But when we take a look at the isolation technology that could be applied to it, you know we we have a much different case. So uh, here, because uh, we, we've got a picture of uh, uh, essentially identical isolators that do the same process, the, the picture of the hard wall isolator at the bottom left and, and the unit in the middle, these were uh, identical isolators. The, the, the flexible isolator was developed to uh, get validation done in the process, make validation batches of the product and so forth, uh, but they're identical. But you can see that the cleaning area, the surface uh, that, that needs to be cleaned on a hard wall isolator in this case is about 20,000 square inches. So we have a huge amount of, of cleaning surfaces, and that doesn't include, include the glove surfaces, which those can be some of the most difficult surfaces to clean. Whereas we have the single use isolator that we're going to dispose after use. So fundamentally, there's no cleaning. There, there may be a wet in place or, or something like that, but Virtually, we've eliminated all of that cleaning, which we've eliminated an SOP. We all want to eliminate as many SOPs as we possibly can and in, in, in the validation that goes along with that. Um, and, and also with the single-use technology, one of the interesting things is we look at hard wall technology and lyophilization isolation is uh, there, there's a tendency to always want to do glove testing and integrity testing of those gloves, which takes uh, another SOP and, and so forth. Uh, in single-use technology, the whole assembly 
uh, can be integrity tested at the factory before it's it's sent to uh, the the customer for use. So a lot of SOPs can be reduced, a lot of validation reduced, and and all of that goes to cost reduction, risk reduction, uh, better efficiency use of the equipment and the technology. And so uh, here's where we really see uh, the 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 main benefit of single use technology is to dispose of, not to clean, uh, reducing all of those costs. So we also then uh, think about, uh, well, the performance of uh, single-use technology. Um, what is the capability? Early in the uh, webinar, we had a slide that currently uh, containment uh, projects uh, are, are always under 100 nanograms per cubic meter in terms of the containment target or needing the containment performance. So what about containment in the lyophilization process? And like our friend here, Sasquatch, uh, data in lyophilization containment is very, very rare to find. Um, and, and so, and, and the, the reason that is, is when we think about how will we get data, um, can we get real-time data on processes? Typically, there's not a lot of uh, uh, assessments done on live product, on the active product. Um, and so the surrogate testing is, is usually the methodology. But, but here, how do we mimic that? How do we create a, a surrogate test when in the lyophilization we start with a liquid? Um, and so in a best-case scenario, uh, we're not going to have any exposure from that, so we, we, we really don't have much risk. Um, we have the containment in place really to protect the product from outside uh, contamination and bacteria and so forth, uh, but we have very little risk there. And then after the freeze-drying process, okay, so we do have some potential of airborne uh, contamination and uh, exposure and so forth. That's why we have the, the isolation containment, but how do we mimic that? So it's a very difficult process to try to uh, mimic and to get data on to say, well, what is the performance of an isolator in a lyophilization process? And so here we rely on, on data sets of similar processes and so forth. So uh, using the ISPE SMEPAC protocol that's typically applied to containment studies. So we look for other data sets that will give us that high level of confidence. And, and at the end of the day, that's what the SMEPAC test is trying to do is to give us a high level of confidence that the containment system is going to perform as needed. So one of the things we would reference is uh, using a single-use isolator. Um, in this case, uh, this is a data set from a weigh-in dispense system. Um, so here, uh, okay, weigh-in dispense where we're actually openly handling the, the, the product, the powder inside, in this case, the surrogate. Um, and so we're getting powder airborne, um, and, and so we're, we're seeing that we, we have to have the isolation of the operators from the process. Uh, I think the key here is in the gold box that we have in the middle, and, and you can see that uh, we measured what the uh, airborne uh, particulate was inside, particularly on this where we were using a negative pressure system. So at the extract filter, we were seeing 506 micrograms per cubic meter uh, of, of product. So uh, we know we had a challenge inside. We, we know we had airborne particulate. And then you can see on the right that we were passing uh, the test that, that needed to be uh, below 60 nanograms per cubic meter. Um, so in the case of how the statistical analysis was applied, uh, the isolator passed all of that. So we use data sets like this to say, well, we, we, we may not have a lot of data on a lyophilizer, but if we look at the scenario of what we have to contain and what the challenge is, and if we can apply these data sets, we can start to get a high level of confidence that the isolation technology will perform in those upset conditions, and particularly when we can prove that there was a challenge of airborne particulate here. So, and lastly, just taking a look at uh, this comparison of the single-use systems to the hard wall systems, you know, we really look at from a, a straight cost analysis, the capital expenditure cost uh, and the operating expenditure. So, so here we go through that analysis very quickly with just the, the, the very key points and, and really on the capital expenditure, single use projects are typically implemented for 20% or less of the cost than a hard wall isolator. So in that direct comparison, there's a, a massive cost savings 
uh, in, in the capital spend. We also know that the time to implement a single-use system is much faster. The engineering time is faster. The mock-ups aren't as critical because, uh, again, this, the flex wall systems are more flexible for the operators and changes can be made after the initial uh, implementation of the isolator. So we know project times are cut way back and startup and validation, validation times are, are cut way back. So in the CapEx, there's a, a massive cost savings. Uh, rhetorically, there's a thought that, okay, but then I have consumables that I have to buy. But there needs to be always the direct comparison of those cleaning costs for a hardwall isolator against the disposal of a single-use isolator. So uh, we, we've worked on projects where customers literally complete a process, uh, dispose of the isolator, uh, install, install another isolator, another flexible isolator, and are ready to run a different product within hours. And, and that's impossible to do with a hardwall isolator with the cleaning validation that needs to go on, the hold times that need to go on, and so forth. And then away from the real cost that can be calculated in CapEx and OpEx, we look at risk mitigation and, and what does uh, risk mitigation uh, do for us in, in terms of the uh, single-use isolator. And it really comes back to that cross-contamination and potential. So we know that there always is going to be retention and retention being defined as as product that was not completely clean from a surface. And so, again, thinking back to the lyophilization process and, and that these non-product or indirect product contact surfaces in, in, in this case need to be treated as product contact surfaces. We don't want to have residual powder, retained powder that can go from batch one into batch two or product A into product B. So there's a range of, of risks that are completely mitigated by using a single-use type of technology where we have it a single-use, uh, potentially a, a uh, contamination that's uh, decontamination that's done, and then a disposal. So this is one of the keys for using single-use technology in the lyophilization process. So that, that brings us to the end of the webinar. And um, uh, we, we, we now can take uh, the questions. I'm going to hand it back over to our host to, to manage that. Um, this presentation is available, and you can contact our marketing department and Stephanie Arthurs. Uh, her address is here. And also, uh, please uh, follow our website, uh, ilcdover.com, and you'll see that in uh, this time of COVID-19 that we're substituting uh, the work that we would do with customers at trade shows for a webinar series. So please follow our website for upcoming webinars as well. And with that, I'll hand it back to our host. Thank you very much. Uh, so as everyone watching, to send your questions in, just type into the box in the top left-hand corner of your screen, click Submit, and then wait to hear if they're read aloud. We had quite a few come in, so we can just get started with. Is a flexible wall isolator only single use, or can it be used multiple times? Right, right. So um, again, that's that's always uh, the question um, uh, because uh, it, it seems as though after a use, it it seems to be, uh, if you will, brand new. Um, it's not an issue of robustness, and so flexible technology executed correctly um, has the ability, in terms of robustness, to be used uh, for for many operations. Um, the trick goes back to again, why clean it? Because there's a cost to cleaning it versus the disposal, and, and why have the risk of the cross-contamination? So, so um, the, the general industry thinking is single use and dispose of, and, and to not have the cost and the risk of cleaning. But, but it's not because of robustness. Uh, certainly, again, as I said, a well-executed isolator from the right materials will, uh, could be used on many, many batches of, of the process. Okay, thank you. On to the next question, which asks, after using a single-use isolator, how is it disposed, and is this considered a sustainable technology? Right, so the, um, uh, the typical disposal, disposal method for a single-use system, and, and again, um, uh, for reference, uh, the typical isolator is made from a polyethylene-based uh, flexible material. 
Um, the, the, the most popular way, depending on uh, uh, the material that was used inside, uh, the more potent the material, uh, there tends to be just to uh, to go to incineration with it, and uh, the polyethylene material can be incinerated without uh, environmental risk. The um, there also can be the disposal to landfill. Um, again, looking at it from a standpoint of uh, what what was inside and the contamination. Um, in in terms of the sustainability question, this is uh, it's a fascinating subject that's being explored quite a bit in the biofarm uh, area these days, and sustainability since we're using uh, literally thousands and thousands of tons of single-use products and, and what's going to happen. Uh, but looking at it from a sustainability standpoint, uh, one of the key points that, that's been studied is uh, the cleaning process, which uses a lot of, of liquids, a lot of water, in some cases a lot of solvents, create a, a, a very um, uh, large waste stream in a lot of cases, that waste stream, including the water, goes to incineration as well. And so the studies that are coming out are starting to show that uh, from a sustainability standpoint, overall uh, uh, impact on the, uh, on the environment, that it's, it's more sustainable to use a single-use product and do incineration than uh, making uh, WFI water, using the water for cleaning, contaminating that water with the materials that are being processed and then and, and then incinerating that water. So so uh, we do see more and more studies coming out arguing clearly that uh, single-use products are sustainable. Okay, very nice. A uh, question here asking, is PPE still required for operators when using an isolator? So we, we work with our, our customers on this uh, a lot, and, and, and so the decision is always uh, within each company and, and their safety requirements. Uh, a lot of times that goes to also you know, how the employees feel and, and what risk they have. Um, the, the reality is, is data, data, data. Um, so we've worked with customers that uh, start off with full PPE, including perhaps a uh, uh, a powered air purified respirator, a PAPR, um, and through uh, training and through monitoring and collecting data, uh, they've been able to to downgrade that from from PAPR to lesser PPE. So it's it's possible, but um, what we see it's a progression that our customers will go through that they have a a process that they know they have to contain, um, and so there is risk, and so they put the operators into the appropriate PPE, but then as data is gathered, they could scale that back if they want or go with the belt and suspenders approach that I have isolation technology that's that's keeping the room safe, the, the operator safe, but as a, an additional protection, I'm going to stay with the PPE. So often a case-by-case um, a -case decision. Okay, thank you. Someone here has asked how to de decontaminate the flexible isolator after the unloading operations of freeze-dried products after the process. Right, so there's um, a, a range of, of methods as we've seen from our, our customers. It can be as simple as a wet-in-place uh, using just uh, water and, and, and a, a spray wand or spray bottles and so forth. Um, <laughs> it, it, again, depends on uh, exactly what the compound is and so forth. Some companies will go for more of a solvent-based uh, uh, wet-in-place or, or even uh, uh, maybe a complete cleaning and wetting and so forth. So the single-use isolators, uh, polyethylene-based, there, there are some others like a polyurethane-based that are, are not really solvent-resistant, but if, if, the, um, if the compound uh, needs to be decontaminated uh, or destroyed using a solvent, uh, pretty much that's okay to spray that inside the, the isolator, uh, potentially capture that in the isolator or, or drain that away from the isolator system. Um, and then at that point, uh, a, a process to remove the isolator is followed to assure, again, that the room and the operators are not exposed. Okay. Well, very good. I'm afraid that's all the time we have for today, which just leaves a big thanks to Scott for the great presentation, and of course to ILC Dover for sponsoring this session. Uh, to everyone listening, 
Oh, you may have had some audio issues with the second video. Just want to confirm that once the on-demand version goes out shortly, that will all be fixed. So that's a good chance to come back and listen to it again. Okay, and also feel free to watch the on-demand version when it comes out on our website, which is www.business-review-webinars.com. We look forward to sharing further webinars with you, so please do keep an eye out on the website just mentioned. And follow us on Twitter at BR Webinars for daily updates and join our LinkedIn group, Business Review Webinars. Thank you all once again. I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day.